Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to give just a very quick overview of the goals we had in developing this patent technology. So our, our goal over, uh, was to create a non toxic heat transfer fluid that overcomes the traditional limitations of a propylene glycol water mix, those being mainly uh, increased viscosity as well as lower, lower thermal transfer properties. And uh, we've done that. Dr. Clancy will describe those in a minute. We believe that this finished product will have a wide variety of uses in various industries. Those industries include uh, space applications, uh, ground heat pumps, food production, and in even vehicles, uh, starting with uh, specialized uses in the vehicle industry. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Clancy, who will uh, describe the technology for you. Hello. My name is Dave Clancy. I am the Chief Technology Officer for Ag Technology. Uh, we also the patent attorney for the patent. We have an issued patent from the patent office on this technology. Our inventor is Dr. John Olson. And John has been working on this project since 2012 for three years. Uh, thanks to the Environmental Protection Agency, we, we had a research contract to develop uh, an antifreeze that was really replacing ethylene glycol, which is commonly, uh, commonly used. And everybody, a lot of people know that ethylene glycol is a toxic substance, that it is a poison, according to the Association of American uh, poison control centers. Uh, nearly 6,000 people were poisoned in 2012, some of them children. And they, they uh, also kill countless numbers of dogs and animals because of their sweet taste. So our goal was to improve the heat transfer. We, we did that originally uh, in analysis. Our purpose of coming to the American Chemical Society is to outline some new, more testing that we did, more conventional testing, showing again that this was a substantial improvement in heat transfer of the fluid. That's that business question. I'm leaving that to Michael. <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer for one reason. Uh, you, you have the cost of the actual product itself, which um, is certainly mostly based on propylene glycol and, and uh, water. Uh, the nanoparticles will, because they're used in such a, um, a small amount, we're, we're talking one, two percent range, uh, they add a little cost, not a lot. But really, when you look at the cost of something, you have to look at the total cost of ownership. You know, is there a savings uh, in the lower viscosity and in, in the energy required to pump it through the system? Uh, how long does it last? And, and some of those questions we've yet to uh, address in our testing, but we feel that the ultimate cost of this thing will be either near or even below the cost of a traditional propylene glycol water mixture. Yeah, one, one of the properties, and I, I'd like Dr. Clancy to address this a little bit more, but one of the properties that we're seeing in this mixture is a sheer thinning uh, property, which uh, uh, in, in movement reduces the viscosity substantially, which would lower the pumping cost. Dr. Clancy. Yes, uh, carry on with that. We're noticing an improvement of about 1.7%. A 1.7 improvement in heat transfer. So it's almost a doubling of the heat transfer capacity of the fluid. Uh, not quite, but almost doubling of the capacity of the fluid. Um, I should backtrack and say, give a little credit, that Argonne Labs was the original um, inventor by Dr. Stephen Choi, who invented or got the first patent actually on nanofluids. But it's always been a stumbling block because in reality, they haven't been working. They, they work in conduction, but in convection, 
most people have been able to, using a surfactant to hold these nanoparticles together. Um, what Dr. Olson came up with was a, a, a type of nanoparticle that is, is positively charged. They're not spheres, they're long chains, and they seem to, they don't need, we've had stable products for about three years now. We see no settling taking place. This is unique. And because we didn't, we weren't buying by using this surfactant, we didn't have the viscosity penalty that so many other people, our predecessors and researchers, have stumbled into. So that, that's really why we got the uh, patent, was because we had a nanofluid that did not have, um, did not have uh, uh, surfactants to hold them together. And it was very stable and really superior performance. Now, 1.7 is not an insignificant amount. Uh, the amount of... Uh, uh, Weight that goes into into uh, into cars is critical, and if the radiator can be smaller, the amount of fluid pumping can be smaller, and the um, pumping there's usually a, a penalty for pumping a high viscous fluid, but actually this has demonstrated a shear thinning viscosity. And shear thinning, people ask me, give me an example of something shear thinning. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when painters used to have hats on when they painted ceilings because the ceiling paint. Uh, dripped. Uh, this additive acts similar to that, where if, when you paint ceilings now, they shear. When you're painting it, you're moving it, it actually gets thinner. And as soon as you stop, it actually gets thicker. So you don't have this dripping uh, of the paint. And the same thing happens on our fluid. We notice as it's flowing, it actually the viscosity reduces, which is kind of unique about it. And they, also, just the way these particles are actually made, they're not the spheres, they're not the other particles, they're long chain. They're a pyrogenic type of process, a flame process uh, that, that makes these particles. And um, that's, that's kind of hopefully that explains your question. No, uh, one of the nice things about um, the particles are in are have uh, hundreds of thousands of times, no, what should I say, a thousand times better thermal conductivity than actually the base fluid. So by putting in the right fluid in, it actually, the right particle in, I'm not sorry, it, it, thermal conductivity of these metallic substances are much higher than the base fluid. And if you can put some in, you can actually increase the heat transfer of all, all of them. Now, if you ask what mechanism actually it's doing, um, we think shear thinning has a part of it. The other thing it has is surface area. These materials have, for one, one gram, which is a very small amount, one gram of these particles, have a surface area of 100 square meters. So that, we think, plays a part in it as well, as far as being able to conduct heat transfer. Most heat transfer has to do with surface area. These particles, particular particles, have huge surface areas for their weight. Um, actually, the science that goes into the, what's actually happening at the boundary layer, uh, we have not been able to, um, we don't have the mechanism to do that. We're just observing really the effect. Uh, there are other papers or other researchers have, have said what their opinions are on why this is happening. Uh, there's a recent paper produced by some Korean researchers having to do with oil, um, heat transfer oils, and, and they theorize why these particles, particles work. But um, we're not there yet. We, 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 we're just reporting on the effect of, the, of, of our research. Is that a pretty good answer, John? Yeah. Uh, aluminum oxide. And then one of them, and one of them is called silica oxide with aluminum oxide coatings. Those are some of the best ones that we've, we've uh, right, right. Yeah, uh, 
propylene glycol, as far as our country goes, and MSDS, is, is, it does not require any special handling of, uh, of the fluid. Uh, so uh, we don't anticipate it. One of the savings that we could actually have that Michael was mentioning was life cycle cost, was the disposal cost not having, having to deal with it as a toxic chemical. Um, the propylene glycol is a food ingredient uh, that is used in food, some certain foods, so to keep it soft. If I could just add one thing, the original funding for this project was from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, I don't think they would have touched it uh, had it been a problem. <laughs> I have to refer back to Dr. Olson. This is carpet. Did, did you hear the question? Whether I could be using carpet cleaning? Ethylene? Oh, do you have an airplane? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, the base fluid propylene glycol is often sometimes used at airports for de icing. So, propylene glycol is, a, is presently a the icing fluid. Uh, ethylene glycol is less expensive. Um, propylene glycol is a lot safer. I'll start with that. Um, last year, I was on a panel at the National Science Foundation. One of my fellow panelists was responsible for uh, uh, Ford's uh, future products. He was working on a model year five years out. Uh, that, that's the typical lead time for the automotive industry. In order for them to take full advantage of the capabilities of, of this um, transfer, heat transfer fluid, They'd have to do significant redesigns on some of the uh, components of the uh, air conditioning system, of the uh, uh, engine cooling system. So we expect that uh, the adoption by the general vehicle industry would be likely, probably five years, maybe even longer. We have had inquiries from governmental agencies who have uh, large vehicles overseas. And they are required by law that when they drain their antifreeze out of their ethylene glycol, they have to return it home where it can be recycled. And they're very interested in using this type of product where they would not have those same restrictions. So that's probably where we would start on the vehicle commercialization. <laughs> 